Welcome back. This is the second part of my analysis of the Let It Be and Get Back documentaries. I'm going to start at the beginning of the second episode of the Get Back documentary, right after George has left the band. So we start with this caption. The Beatles have been rehearsing songs for a live album and a TV special. George Harrison has not been happy and left the band on Friday. In the original film, none of this is explained. We're not shown that George leaves, which I thought was always extremely weird. One moment, they're performing I Me Mine, and John and Yoko are waltzing to the music, and then it fades to black, and the next moment, we're at Apple Studios. And nothing that happens in between is, is mentioned or explained whatsoever. So I'm grateful that they did at least talk about George leaving and them having to try to coax him back to the band. A meeting on Sunday did not resolve the situation. The future of not only the project, but the group itself, is now in doubt. As Monday gets underway, only one band member shows up, and that is Ringo. Michael, Lindsay, Hogg and Ringo have an interesting conversation. Ringo asks Michael, what will be the nature of the documentary? And Michael says, well, if we're not hiding, then we have a lot to say. We've probably already got our documentary. But if we are hiding, then we don't have much. So they pull together as a group to discuss the future of the project after Billy and Linda turn up. Linda starts to talk about how yesterday Yoko was talking for John. I have a feeling that half the stuff Yoko said yesterday isn't mm, she was talking for John. And then Billy backs her up and says, John didn't talk, so Yoko talked for John. And then he makes his famous quip about it'll be so funny in 50 years' time if they say they broke up because Yoko sat on an amp. I don't want to say too much about this now because I'm going to talk about it later on in this video. But the way that Let It Be and Get Back were edited, it makes it seem like Yoko was a very quiet presence in the room. But if you've listened to the Nagra tapes, the source audio recording for the film, you'll know that that's not true. And she did actually speak up quite a lot, including passing comment on how the writing of their songs was going and the arrangement of their songs. So she was a much more invasive presence than either film makes out. Billy then says something really quite desperate. In fact, I wasn't quite sure whether or not he was serious, because it was such a bizarre thing to say. He says, I have an idea for the ending of the show. We get the editor of something like the Daily Mirror, and a whole bunch of really hard-hitting journalists, and we have a show where we do songs that are interspersed with red-hot news from the, the four corners of the globe. And the last bulletin is that the Beatles have broken up. And that's the end of the show. And Ringo's face is of one of absolute horror. By that point, Billy also looks really stressed. And then famously says, and then there were two. I really wonder what Billy was thinking in this moment. And obviously we can never know, but we can have some idea, I guess, based on what he says in memoirs. Maybe something along the lines of, well, I've given up my entire life to be Paul McCartney of the Beatles, and now the Beatles might not be together anymore. And what will happen to me? And what the hell am I going to do? Whilst Neil Aspinall is trying to get John on the phone, they then ask Michael Lindsay Hogg what he feels about the project. And he admits that he was in two minds of leaving as well. And then he says, but I thought they won't notice because you guys never listen to me. And everybody laughs, but actually it's a serious point. In fact, it's the same point that Billy made on the 7th of January. And here we are on the 13th of January and nothing has really changed. I'm really surprised that Michael Lindsay Hogg put up with as much grief as he did. 
Maybe he felt he couldn't do anything else. But he's the love child of Orson Welles, and I really cannot imagine Orson Welles putting up with the grief that Michael Lindsay Hogg does as the director of Let It Be. Then we're told this. John arrives at lunchtime. He and Paul go to the cafeteria for a private conversation. And we hear this conversation because they've hidden microphones in a flower pot. The dialogue that we see on the screen and hear in the Get Back documentary is edited to make it seem like only John and Billy are talking to each other. But actually, it involves pretty much everybody. Initially, it's John and Billy, Yoko, Linda and Ringo. But eventually, everybody turns up. I mean, really everybody. Neil Aspinall, Mal Evans, Michael Lindsay Hogg, Glyn Johns, even George Martin turns up with some cables. And none of this is told to us in the Get Back documentary. And in fact, they only partially admit to it in the Get Back book. But if you listen to the source recordings from the Nagra tapes, it's all there, albeit in very poor quality audio. The source recording has about 29 minutes of dialogue. And then it cuts off because presumably the tape runs out. Right at the beginning of the conversation, John talks about Yoko. And it's clear that before they walk in the room, some words have been had about Yoko's presence in the group. John says, I mean, I'm not going to lie. You know, I would sacrifice you all for her. This is how it was, you know. And that's all it was. She comes everywhere, you know. Billy says, so where's George? John says, fuck knows where George is. Yoko interjects, oh, you can get back George so easily. You know that. And then John says, but it's not that easy because it's a festering wound. And yesterday we allowed it to go even deeper and we didn't give him any bandages. And the way that that conversation is edited together in the Get Back documentary, it makes it seem like John's saying that to Billy, but he isn't. He's actually saying to Yoko. And I thought that was really interesting because that actually is John disagreeing with Yoko. And I wondered why they changed it because, I mean, it doesn't really matter whether he says it to Yoko or whether he says it to Billy. And I wondered whether that edit was something that Yoko asked for because it's very important that she's the very loyal widow of John Lennon and that they never had a crossword. That's part of their mythology. Or maybe we're being asked to reassess our opinions on how John and Billy relate to each other. But equally, it could be just because it was easier in the edit to make it look like it was just John and Paul having a conversation. I don't know, but there's a deception here. And that's really what I wanted to point out. Then they talk about whether or not George is coming back. Billy says, if he isn't, then he isn't. Then it's a new problem. To which John says, if we want him, and I'm still not sure whether I do want him, but if we do decide we want him as a policy, I can go along with that because the policy has kept us together. And I thought that was really quite cold of both of them, but particularly John. Now, in the Get Back documentary, we only get a few moments of this quite lengthy conversation that is had in the cafeteria. And it's a real shame, although not very surprising, that they don't include more. In that lunchtime conversation, we can hear John saying to Billy, there might be guilt among the rest of the members in the group. And then he clarifies his point by saying, because I know that I've adjusted to you. I've adjusted to you for selfish reasons and because I didn't know what else to do, but I have adjusted to you. That clip is such a gold nugget of PID clues and it's such a shame that the audio quality is so poor because it's probably the only time that we'll ever get John actually admitting in a roundabout way that Billy is not poor. Maybe if I can figure out how to use some AI to clear it up, I'll bring it to you. But until then, I can't. One of the things that makes it really difficult to work out what people are saying 
uh, other than the background sounds of the cafeteria, is Yoko. She speaks constantly. She's jabbering on and on, having some kind of conversation with Linda, except she's not really having a conversation. She's just talking at her. One of the other interesting bits that comes out from that conversation is this. John says, It's like George said, he didn't get enough satisfaction anymore because of the compromise he had to make to be together, that is, in the Beatles. When something came out like Revolver or whatever, there was still that element of surprise that we didn't know where it came from. But now we know exactly where it came from and how it arrived at that particular noise and how it could have been much better or needn't have been at all. The only way to get it satisfactory for yourself is to do it on your own, but then it's too hard. Now what does that mean? When something came out like Revolver, there was still that element of surprise that we didn't know where it came from. Surely you know where your own album comes from. I mean, unless he's talking about that in the sort of mystical sense of the word, I really don't know what he means. Unless he's suggesting the albums came from somewhere else, i.e. that they had professional writers and professional musicians working on their album, and they only sang on them. And that's why it sounded like a surprise to them when they finally heard it. I don't know what it means, and it's a statement that's very open to interpretation, so I'll just let you ponder over it. So after lunch, John suggests that they go and meet with George again, but they can't because George has gone to Liverpool and he won't be back until Wednesday. So in the meantime, they start to work on the song Get Back. At this point, they were meant to have live shows on the 19th and 20th of January, but because they've now got up to the 13th and they've still basically not really achieved anything, they then push those dates forward to the 26th and 27th. John, in a quip, says to Michael Lindsay Hogg at the end of the working day, I'm going to leave my guitar here as a sign that I will be back tomorrow. And then Billy joins in and says, and what greater act of faith can a man have? And he picks up his bass and reads out the list of songs that Paul had stuck to the side of his guitar from the last time that they played together, which was really sad to see because, you know, Paul is gone. And I thought it was really weird that Billy read it out. I don't know why he did that. I guess it was because he was really trying to stay in character. So now it's Tuesday the 14th of January, and Billy is talking to the clapperboard guy, Paul Bond. The great thing about a piano is that there it all is. All the music ever, that's it, you know. And I thought, yeah, absolutely, spoken like a true pianist. That's how I feel about the piano. That's how most people feel about the piano, who have the piano as a fast instrument. Billy has the piano as a first instrument, but Paul doesn't. The piano is always a giveaway with Billy, because his affection and his knowledge and his skill set at the piano as his first instrument just shines through over and over again. And it's, for me, one of the things that always, even when I was a very small child, made me very, very suspicious that he was not Paul. So then Ringo turns up and they have a little blues jam at the piano. Billy plays Woman, the song that was given to Peter and Gordon. He plays a little bit of Backseat of My Car. And then he plays A Song of Love. And he does it in this sort of faux operatic voice that then turns into a sort of Vivian Stanshall kind of voice. Sometimes I think that Billy really likes to tease us with the truth in plain sight. And sometimes I think that Billy might have been happier being Vivian for the rest of his days, rather than being Paul. The set for the Magic Christian turns up. They're not meant to film it, and they're certainly not meant to play on it. And yet, even Billy climbs up it. Because, obviously, they have so much time on their hands. They've already had to move their deadline forward by a week, and yet they just keep wasting more time, which I think proves it wasn't really a deadline in the first place. 
As the rest of the set is being brought in, the band and the crew sit down together. They can't really do very much now because there's too much commotion in the studio. John does this sort of fake comedic interview of Ringo and he asks him, so what does religion mean to a pop star? But as he says it, we don't see Ringo, we see Billy. And I thought that was very interesting because, of course, Billy is meant to be the centre of the new religion of Paulism. And I wondered if that was a very subtle hint at that. So here they all are together. And Billy says, look, we can't go on like this. What we need is a serious programme of work, not an aimless rambling amongst the canyons of your mind. The canyons of your mind being a song by the Bonzos. In fact, Billy wrote that song under the moniker of Vivian Stanshall, and it was the B-side to I'm the Urban Spaceman, which was the only hit that they had as a band. The A-side was written by his good friend Neil Innes, and it was released in the UK on the 11th of October 1968, which is about three months before Billy finds himself sitting here raising this song into the conversation. Officially, that single was produced by Paul McCartney under the pseudonym of Apollo C. Vermouth, but actually, Billy, Vivian and Paul are all one and the same person. So Michael Lindsay Hogg is speaking, and he says that he feels that the documentary is grinding to a halt, so what do we do? John Lennon sarcastically says, grinding to a halt, it's just taking off. And he starts talking in song lyrics to be funny, but the situation is clearly dire. And he makes jokes about masturbation and Boy Scouts. And then they work on Madman and Mean Mr. Mustard for a bit. But again, nothing gets finished. At the end of the day, Michael Lindsay Hogg asks the group what they're going to do going forward. Are they now just making an album? Do they want a TV show? Are they going to do a live performance? What is actually going to go on? And they say they want to go and see George and then think about it. And then Billy says, well, I think we stop filming now as a matter of policy. So then we're told rehearsals are cancelled tomorrow. John, Paul and Ringo will meet George again meaning that at this stage, the project really has ground to a halt. So here we are on the Wednesday, the 15th of January, we're halfway through the month. They still haven't achieved very much. If you're in any doubt about that, consider the original brief. They had to write 14 new songs in two weeks, so basically one a day as an average, then play a live concert, have it recorded, use it as the basis for a live album, and then have all of this footage that they've been making in the meantime made into a TV documentary about the Beatles at work. They've now burnt through the whole of those two weeks. What do they actually have to show for it? We, as an audience, still have not heard one single song played all the way through. Now, whether that was an editorial decision or not is another matter, i.e. they had the film footage to play a song all the way through but they chose not to. I don't know whether that's the case, but by showing us only fragments, it gives the impression that nothing was finished. In any case, the meeting with George is positive and constructive. The Beatles agree to adjust the direction of the Get Back project. The live TV special is abandoned. They will relocate to their new Apple studio and record the songs there. So then we're told a little bit about Magic Alex building them a new studio and the fact that the Beatles will move into their basement studio on Monday. So here we are on Thursday the 16th of January. All of the equipment from Twickenham Film Studios is being packed up and taken to the Apple studios. The only member of the Beatles that comes in to do any work is Billy, and he takes the opportunity to record a demo of Oh Darling, which we don't see or hear all of, which was a shame. 
He's also recording that demo whilst the crew are packing up and making a lot of noise, so I don't actually know how he managed to record a demo. Glyn Johns is the only member of crew that isn't packing up, and he is the one who assists Billy to make his demo. Can we just take a moment to acknowledge that Glyn looks cool all the way through this film. He has great hair, great sunnies, and the best of jackets. Never mind the Beatles, Glyn is your boy. He's the height of fashion. George arrives at Twickenham to meet up with Glyn, and they go to the Apple Studios. And Glyn and George are not happy with what they find because Magic Alex is a lying con man. Glyn sends an urgent SOS to George Martin. And George Martin gets EMI to urgently send portable recording equipment to Savile Row. Dave Harris, Keith Slaughter and a team from Abbey Road work through the weekend to install the equipment. This is the weekend of the 18th and 19th of January. Bearing in mind that they were meant to originally have finished writing all the songs by this point, and the next two days they were meant to be doing live shows. They haven't even started properly recording anything yet. They don't even have a proper working studio to work in yet. That's how disorganised this project has been. It's not merely a case that they haven't got anything written. It's not merely a case they haven't got anything rehearsed. They don't even have a working studio. And I don't really understand why it was so important to build one either. If, for whatever reason, they didn't want to work at the Abbey Road studios, then they could have simply gone to another studio, like Trident, or Olympia, or any other London-based studio. An eight-track recording desk is created by lashing two portable four-track mixing consoles together. Again, why? They're the Beatles. Why don't they just have this equipment? Why are they cobbling things together? I just don't understand. The sound is then fed into George Harrison's eight-track recorder. And again, why are they having to borrow their own equipment? Why did they leave Abbey Road? Especially since they end up borrowing its equipment. So here we are, it's Monday the 20th of January. They were meant to be giving a live show. But the whole premise of this project was stupid right from the start, and they basically set themselves up to fail. You get these establishing shots of the streets uh, outside and surrounding Savile Row, which is where they've now moved to, because that's where the Apple Studios are. And in amongst them, we get this blink-and-you-miss-it moment. We get a picture of a newsstand for the London Evening Standard. And it says, Rosemary's Baby the weird Mia Farrow film that has the censor anxious. Very interesting when you consider that that, of course, is filmed at the Dakota, which is where John and Yoko will end up living, but they haven't got there yet. And, of course, it will also be where John is shot dead. On Monday morning, the Apple studio is not quite ready. The Beatles will continue to rehearse and start recording on Tuesday. The outside camera crew talk to the Apple scruffs that have been hanging around outside of the Apple offices. They talk to the lady on the left, who is called Eileen. They ask her about the possibility of the band breaking up. She says, well, obviously I don't want them to break up, but I don't come for all of them. It's just Paul I come for so it doesn't really matter. I'm sure that really delighted the other Beatles to know that it didn't really matter. John always said that he felt the original Let It Be documentary was really the Paul show, meaning Billy. And when you have moments like this, you can't help but feel that that's right. Tuesday the 21st of January. So now three weeks have passed. Three weeks. They should have been giving the second of their two live performances at this point. They've only just started recording. That's how disorganised this entire project is. George Martin comes in and says very optimistically, pointing towards the boom mics that are picking up the conversations, you'll be able to get rid of these once we get set up. 
and then everybody laughs. Like, no, we're not taking those away, sunshine. And it's probably a good thing too, because I think those Nagra reels contain information that's pretty interesting. At this point, we get the information that the TV special footage, shot in 16mm, will now become film footage for a feature film to be put out at the cinema, which means it should have been 35mm. They speak about doing a live outdoor show of some kind, maybe at Primrose Hill, but now there's another problem. Glyn Johns is booked on another recording session in LA, and he only has a few days left to finish his work with the Beatles. So now they're really, really against the clock. Next, we see the Beatles reading an article in a newspaper by Michael Housego, which talks about a fight between George and John that they claim never happened. Later on, when Billy arrives, and he's last in that day, he reads the rest of the article. In the article, it states that their basic reality is that the Beatles are economically tied together and that no matter what happens, they can't split up and remain successful. They have to stay together. So this adds a sort of sense of tension in the room because on some level, they must have known that was true. And with hindsight, we can now know they were never as successful apart as they were together. So now, for the first time in three weeks, they finally have a studio that they're comfortable working in that is properly bolted together. And rather than thinking, right lads, let's get down to it and get some recording done. No, they muck about some more and swap instruments. And here we can see Billy's on the drums and Ringo, even though he doesn't play, is on the bass guitar. Eventually, however, they start to work on Dig a Pony. And as we hear John singing the words, you can imitate everyone you know, we have this close-up of the bass man sticker from Paul's old guitar. And it's such a beautiful, subtle shot, because there's Billy imitating the bass man. John remarks, imagine if we could have played like this at the cavern. And he talks about how nice it is to be in their new studio uh, and acoustically how much better it is. And then he turns to George and says, hey, we were there, weren't we? Meaning the cavern, which is kind of odd because theoretically so was Paul, but of course Billy isn't Paul. And really... The only person that he played consistently with at the cavern was George. Finally, when they get down to actually recording some songs that they've been working on, they realise that if they're going to do things live, they will need a fifth member of the band. They need a pianist. And as if by magic, the very next day, Wednesday, the 22nd of January, Billy Preston shows up and we are told, Billy has just arrived in London to film a couple of TV appearances. He drops by to say hi, unaware that the Beatles need a keyboard player. Really? Isn't that lucky? <laughs> Me thinks some phone calls were made, and that's why he's actually there. So they get down to it, they start playing together, they're trying to teach uh, Billy Preston the songs that they've been working on so far, and they say, you're giving us a lift, Bill. I've often wondered whether it was George Harrison who arranged for Billy Preston to join the group, and whether he did so in part as a subtle wind-up to Billy Shears, because having Billy Preston in the room meant having to say the name Billy quite a lot in front of Billy Shears, but he obviously now in the role of Paul, couldn't react to it. Something else apparently happened this day. In Peter Jackson's original 18-hour edit of the Get Back documentary, which was whittled down to a mere eight hours, so they lost ten, there was apparently a section 
where Alan Williams, the former Beatles manager, turns up. And in that section, he was meant to have been bringing the only surviving recording of the Beatles playing Summertime, which was, I'm guessing, the one that was recorded by Bert Kampfert in Hamburg. He's meant to be bringing this recording down, but Alan leaves it in a taxi or a train or something, and he loses it. And there's this whole section, it's about half an hour, in the original edit of Get Back, where this is shown. So it was chopped, but it is spoken about in the Get Back book. And in fact, they also include this photograph, and you can see Alan Williams standing next to John Lennon and Yoko Ono. And he was watching them perform in the studio that day. I thought it was kind of a shame that they never mentioned it at all in the actual documentary. Because honestly, I think I would have rather seen that than hours and hours of the band mucking about. I don't know what Peter Jackson's footage included, but I do know that on the Nagra tapes, Alan Williams asks John Lennon if he has read his book and if he likes it, whether or not he would endorse it. And John has no clue of what he's talking about. And Billy, playing Paul, tries to not engage at all and just says goodnight to him cordially as he goes out the door, and that's about it. I would have really liked to have seen a conversation between Alan Williams and Billy playing Paul because the real Paul McCartney was being sued by Alan Williams at one point because he was cutting Alan out of his commission by acting as a manager for the Beatles during their time in Hamburg. So a conversation between the two of them might have been entertaining. So now it's Thursday, the 23rd of January, and this project should have finished by now. And they finally get to making a fairly decent recording of Get Back. This is the first decent recording they've made in all of this time in January that they've been working together on this project. We get told that the Beatles haven't released a single in five months. And there's all this talk about, you know, we could just finish this today and get this as a single out next week. And nothing actually comes of it. And it's such a shame. They don't put Get Back Out as a single from the recording they make on the 23rd of January, even though they probably could have. The single and album version is actually recorded on the 28th of January. And both versions are in fact the same recording with different edits. There's some extra vocal rooftop ad-libs that are grafted on and cross-faded in to make it seem like the version of Get Back on the album is live, but it actually isn't. It was recorded in a studio. So here we are, Friday the 24th of January. Billy Preston is away for most of the day rehearsing his Lulu TV show special, so he's not at the rehearsals, and as a consequence the Beatles sort of are a bit lost without him, but they try to stay productive. Billy and John have this sort of slightly odd conversation. Billy says to John that their lyrics tell a story across all of the songs that they've written. It's like we get back and then we're on our way home and then we say, well, don't let me down. And then I say, oh, darling, I'll never let you down. And then John says, yeah, it's like you and me are lovers. And I thought this was really bizarre. Firstly, they always seem to want to make the relationship between Billy and John seem a lot more close than it really was. But secondly, they keep hinting that John had some kind of homosexual experiences. Not that he actually was gay, but that he had some kind of bi curiosity. And this is even more curious when we consider that recently there was news that there would be four new Beatles biopics, one film about each of the Beatles, directed by Sam Mendes. When we first got the press releases about the intention to make those films, 
One of the pieces of information that came out with it was the idea that there had been a fan-led request that at least one of the films would feature the Beatles in a group sex scene, because apparently that had happened. And first of all, this is an excellent way to introduce a scene with sex magic. Equally, I wonder if they're trying to, as it were, update the image of the Beatles, because the Beatles are four straight white guys, and that's so last century, in an age where people claim to be non-binary and attracted to trees. So I kind of wonder why they raised this idea to try and change the reputation and the mythology of the Beatles as being much more edgy than they really were. So the day continues, and the mucking about continues, and out of that mucking about comes a version of the Liverpool folk song Maggie May. I've always found the Beatles' rendition of Maggie May quite amusing, because John is trying to make his accent seem as broad as possible, to feign being much more working class than he really was, which of course he does purely for the comedy effect. And then Billy is just tagging along, trying to pretend that he is actually from Liverpool in the first place. Another fun song they play is Fancy My Chances With You. And again, we're told the mythology of all the songs that John and Paul wrote in their early days before they were famous. And then we see that Patty Harrison is the last of the wives and girlfriends to turn up to the studio now making it a full house. Billy Preston is back for the recording of Dig It. The version of Dig It that we get on the Let It Be album is actually recorded two days later, but it has an improv grafted on from this day. And it's where we get the little improv. That was Can You Dig It by Georgie Wood. And now we'd like to do Ark the Angels Come which was grafted on to the end. I have no idea what accent that was, so apologies to my northern brothers and sisters. As they're going out the door at the end of the day, they're talking to George Martin about business, that is to say, his recording work beyond the Beatles. George Harrison is speaking to George Martin, and George Harrison says, I hope it hasn't all gone sour. And... Billy, as he's passing them out the door, quips, you mean your apple hasn't gone rotten? And I thought that was a very interesting clip to have included. Because obviously the rotten apple is a Paul is Dead documentary. Now, Billy couldn't have known about that at the time when he said this in, in this documentary. But the fact that it was included when it's a piece of frippery, really, Alan Williams coming down to see the Beatles was left on the cutting room floor, but this was included. So if it was included, then it was meant to be included. And I think that's the reference. The reference is the Rotten Apple, Paul is Dead documentary. So in order to catch up, they're now having to work at the weekend. It's Saturday the 25th of January. Uh, They don't have Billy Preston because he's doing a TV show. And the Beatles are sitting around talking about their time in India. Billy is talking about the fact that he was watching all of the home movie footage that he had of their time there on the previous night. And John offers his footage to him because Billy wants to make a film. And this is where we get one of my favourite bits of this documentary. They're talking about the experience of being with a Maharishi with being a bit like school and that they should have been themselves more. And George quips, that's the biggest joke to be yourselves. Because that was the purpose of going there. To try to find out who yourself really is. And if you were really yourself, you wouldn't be any of who we are now followed by a judgmental look at Billy. And Billy, all he can do is look down and say, hmm. And I love this because George has made a very deep spiritual point and he's used it as the cover 
to point out not just Billy's deception, but also all of their deception as a group. And then out of all the songs in the world, John starts to play Act Naturally. In the memoirs of Billy Shears, we're told that this song was a direction for Billy and that indeed they were going to make a big star out of him in the role of Paul McCartney. So it's super interesting that John chose to play that song at that moment. So the group are together and they're talking with Glyn because he was meant to be in LA by Tuesday and it's Saturday. So they've only got three days left with him to try and get an entire album recorded. So no pressure. But then Glynn says, actually, I don't have to go until Thursday. But that still means they have to write, rehearse and record 13 or 14 tracks in five days. So understandably, there's a sense of panic in the studio because they can move deadlines, but they will find it very hard to record without him. So then they start to record For You Blue on the 25th of January. And we're told that this take appears on the Let It Be album. That's true and not true in equal measure. The rhythm track, all the instrumental parts, are recorded on this day. But actually George came back almost a whole year later on the 8th of January 1970 to re-record the vocal part. So next we're told they had been discussing whether or not to have a live performance at Primrose Hill, but that's no longer possible, partly because they aren't ready and partly because they couldn't set it up anyway. Then they talk about the nature of the film and now, of course, they're making a film for cinema and Billy points out that 16mm blown up to 35 looks like a mess. No one agrees with him, apart from me. I also agree. And it will take 54 years and advanced AI technology to make it not look like a mess, as we've just seen on Disney+. Plus. Then we are told, however, Michael and Glynn have a suggestion that might give Paul the payoff he's hoping for, because Billy really wants to do some kind of a live show. He thinks that this documentary won't be finished unless there's some kind of a live show at the end, which of course is playing on the roof. And Billy's face absolutely lights up. So they go up onto the roof to check it out. And Michael Lindsay Hogg says, the only thing is, we've got to get some permissions, Paul. I.e. you can't just do it. So the cops don't come and throw us off, that's all. Ringo says, why don't we put a camera on the neighbouring roof? And then Michael replies, because not only would we be had for disturbing the peace and the noise, but also for trespassing. Which is interesting, because later on, when they actually have the rooftop concert, there is someone from a neighbouring building that says, you're on my roof, and I didn't say you could be there. And it's, it's a blink and you'll miss it moment. So I wonder if that's actually true, whether they actually did get permission or not. He, that guy is told repeatedly by the receptionist that, no, no, it's not true, we're not on your roof. But he should know if they're on his roof or not, surely. So anyway, there's a concern that the roof may not support the weight of the band and their equipment. So presumably, therefore, they have to check that out. And that would take some time. But we're never told anything about that. In the meantime, they come down from the roof and George is fixing everybody a drink. And there's a, you might not be able to see it, but there's a little pool of white powder in the middle of his tray between the, the bottles. And that little patch of white powder gets smaller and smaller over the process of this day. Every time he hands a drink to someone, they're swirling it around as if they're mixing something in. And that includes Billy. You see him swirling a glass around with his right hand. So yet another example of him being out of character. Because, of course, Paul was left-handed. 
So after a million takes of Let It Be, and none of them being the final, they pack up for the day, and we are told that the Beatles decide to stage their rooftop concert on Wednesday. Four days from now. And that's where the second episode of the Get Back documentary ends. So they leave us on a cliffhanger. And that's where I'm going to leave you too. Thank you so much for watching this second video about my analysis of the Get Back documentary and the original Let It Be movie. I hope to see you very soon in the third and final part. Goodbye.